Okay, so this is another video in the series for Math 1133 for UTSA. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 12, Applications of Derivatives, uh, specifically Section 1, Local Extrema. So I have a sketch of a graph of a function here. Um, let me adjust this a little bit, actually. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, cool. So we got our horizontal axis, we got our vertical axis, and then we've got the graph the function and I have here um one of the tangent lines drawn out ahead of time so I don't you know stumble and fumble with the interface trying to try to draw it on the fly okay so one more thing I'll pretend that's vertical okay cool so we got this function probably should have an arrow here there we go good enough um, I want to talk about how the different features of the graph relate to the derivative, okay? So, um, zooming in, and we'll focus on one section at a time, um, and then in aggregate, we'll cover the whole graph. Um, looking right here at the y-intercept, let's start with that. I can tell that the slope there is negative because the graph goes down from left to right. It's like, it's a, it's a straight line. I can tell, oh, it's a negative slope, right? It, you know, specifically, I think this would be a slope of negative one, right? So right here, in fact, I'm going to highlight this um, in red. I go out oh, here. And let me change the size of the stylus. Here, uh, the slope is looks to be about negative one. Okay, negative slope. Okay, and that's true for the entire um, this entire section, right? Um, now, if I go to this hill here, and if I focus on say, um, this spot, like right here, okay? To me, that looks to be about a uh, positive one. M is roughly one. And on the other side over here, maybe like right here or a little bit further down here, M is about a uh, negative one. Right here at the top, right? I can see, oh, well here, the slope is exactly zero. Right? I've got a, a horizontal tangent line. If I drew the tangent line, it would be like that, horizontal, right? And then maybe over here, um, let's see right there, maybe the slope is about two or three right here. If we go down further, maybe the slope is about 10, I suppose. If we go down further, maybe the slope right here is, I don't know, 20 or 100, say 100, okay? And as I follow um, the graph down to this corner here, the graph um, kind of straightens out um, at this at this point here. It's kind of a straight line, and I'm, I'm drawing it by hand, so I wobbled a little bit. Anyway, at this corner here, we say, well, what's, what's the slope there? Well, coming in from the left, the slope is negative, and coming in from the right, the slope is positive, right? So basically, long story short, we're going to say that at a corner, we do not have a slope at all. Why is that? There's there's two main reasons, and I'll I'll give the more the less technical, more intuitive one. At least I I suspect. So I could say, well, remember the tangent line is the line that touches the graph, but only once, right? It sort of like uh, rests against the graph, right? Um. So so like here it would be like that, and this one would be like that, and this one would be like that. And I'm doing segments, of course, and then that, and then that, right? So I have these line segments that rest against the graph. Well, if I limit this corner, well, how about that one, or that one, or that one? What, which tangent line is correct, right? So basically, when you have a corner, and then there's multiple lines that could be the tangent line, we say, well, there's no correct one. There, there has to be exactly one value or there's nothing. And this is kind of like the zero over zero thing where it could be anything. That's kind of what's happening here. Um, and I, again, I want to avoid getting into the technical details, but that, that's basically it. Similar reasoning and it's not resolvable. It's not like we can cancel and get something. We get nothing. So basically here, um, M is undefined. We get no derivative. Oops, let me change the stylus size here. M is undefined. Okay, because we have a um because we have a corner. But at all these other um points, the slope is positive on all of that. Okay. And then on the other side, 
maybe um, here. Come on, struggling with the interface here. So maybe here, maybe M is about, I don't know, negative, I don't know, I'm going to say five, just to make something up. And then maybe here, M, um, you know, the slope is about, uh, let's say negative six. And let's say that here it's negative five again. It's it's starting the bottom out there. And then maybe um here it's negative three. And then here it's like negative one. And then here it's zero. And then maybe here. It's about one again. So all along here, the slope is negative, right? Okay. So here the slope is positive. Here the slope is negative. Remember the derivative is slope. The derivative is the slope or more technically accurate, the derivative is a function which gives you the slope at any domain value that you want, right? Um, and I can continue this pattern and say, well, the next place where the slope is zero would be right here, right? And then there's another one, say, I don't know, like right here, right? Um, so I'm gonna have, say, a uh, negative slope there, positive slope here. Now here, uh, this graph goes up, and then it does something, which we'll talk about in a second, and then the graph continues to be uh, increasing there as well. Now if we, um, if we zoom in and consider what happens here, okay, we have a vertical tangent line, and vertical lines do not have slope, right? When you go to the rise over run, you'd be dividing by zero, it doesn't work. There's, there's no run to divide by, right? Um, Essentially, at a point like, say, here, m is about 1, and a point like right here, m is maybe, I don't know, 10 or 50 or something, and then like right here, m, I don't know, like, um, let's say it's 50,000, something like that. It gets very steep, and... You know, if you were able to zoom in and go, okay, well, here m is something like, I don't know, 10 to the 100th power. It's, it's a very, very large number. And at this point here, at this point here, there is no slope. It, it, be, it goes to infinity, in a sense. If you want to think of it that way as a limit, well, the limit would be infinity, okay, if you try to calculate it. And then as soon as you get onto the other side of the graph, the other side of that blue dot, you're just going to have very, very large. It's like here, maybe it's 10 to the 100 power, right? And then uh, say here, maybe this is um, it was about 50,000 or something, or rather 50. I skipped a spot. Here, M is 50,000. And then here, maybe M is 50. Okay, so I just want to look at some of the situations in which um, here M, M does not exist. Write that a little bit neater. M does not exist. You don't get a slope there, okay, because of the vertical tangent line. So one way in which you don't get a derivative is you have a corner, and I should probably clean that up a little bit. Fine, that's okay. Um, but then also a vertical tangent line is another way that you would not get a slope. So whenever the graph is increasing, the derivative is positive. Whenever the graph is decreasing, the derivative is negative. Okay, so we can examine uh, the derivative to tell us about the graph, or we can examine the graph to tell us about the derivative. The, 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 there's a correlation. And if we have one, we implicitly have information about the other. It just matters, well, do we know how to 
tease out that information? Do we know how to find out based on the graph? What's the function doing? The formula doing rather the equation and based on the equation, what's the graph doing? So let's go do an example of, of just that. If we have a function equation, f of x equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 12x plus 5, can I figure out where the graph would be increasing and decreasing based upon this connection between the derivative and the, the graph, increasing versus decreasing? Okay, so step one, I need to find the derivative, right? This is just the function itself, and I need the derivative. And in fact, let's call this step one. So uh, f prime of x equals, this one's easy, just use the power rule. So 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. Okay, now there, there are, oh, you know what? There's, there's two things to consider. I, I did forget something. It's fine. Notice that the graph switches increasing versus decreasing at a corner in this case. It doesn't, doesn't have to, but in this case it does. And the graph also switches increasing versus decreasing here where the slope is zero, where I have a high point in the graph. I have a, a hill. And then when I have a valley, the slope is zero. So the um, derivative switches positive versus negative. The graph switches increasing versus decreasing, vice versa. And then also here um, at the vertical tangent line, the, the slope does not exist. Okay. And when I find the slope does not exist, I don't automatically know, well, is that because of a vertical tangent or because of a corner? That's an examination we have to do separately. But basically, I'm going to be looking for, well, I know that if there's a corner, the graph might switch increasing versus decreasing. I also know if there's a, a high point or a low point, a place where the slope is zero, I might have a switch in increasing versus decreasing. So what I want to do is, is take this derivative and ask, um, where is this undefined and where is this zero? So I'll call this step two. I'll say um, where, and by where, I mean what for what domain values. Where is um, f prime of x undefined? And basically, you know, how do you answer that? Well, you look at the, uh, the function, the expression. This is a quadratic function. So what's the domain? Are there any values um, for which um, this guy is defined? But, but this one is not, well, that would be uh, a number that we want to find. Later, we're, we're going to call that a critical number. I guess we call it that now. The numbers we're looking for are called critical numbers. Now, for a quadratic function, the domain is all real numbers. So I'm going to say, well, nowhere. There are no numbers for which the derivative is undefined. So I don't get anything that way. <clears throat> but now I need to look for, well, where is the derivative equal to 0? OK, we need to solve, uh, let's do this. We need to solve this equation. Okay, so uh, 0 equals 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. And this problem was chosen to be relatively simple. Um, so I'm going to divide by 6 on both sides. I notice I have a common factor of 6, so I'll divide. So 0 equals x squared plus x minus 2. And then this one factors relatively easily, x uh, plus 2 times x minus 1. Okay. Um, so I can use the uh, zero product property. Basically, if you have something times something else makes zero, then one of them has to be zero, right? You can't have like three times five makes zero. That doesn't work. Something times something makes zero means one of those somethings has to be zero. And maybe both of them are. So I'll say zero equals x plus two or zero equals x minus one. Uh, obviously, x plus two and x minus one can't be zero at the same time but for different x values. So I can solve these equations separately. Um, so I'll subtract two on both sides in the case of this left-hand side, and then I'll add one to both sides in the case of the, the right-hand side over here. So I get x equals negative two and x equals one. So these are my critical numbers. So x equals negative two and one. So now what I'm gonna do is I, I'm going to, oh, the concept to review real quick. 90% of the time, maybe maybe 95%, this step um, where you look for where is the derivative undefined will not get you anything. The answer will be nowhere most of the time, especially for the kinds of functions we'll be dealing with, but not all the time. And so it's really important to consider this possibility every time you do one of these problems, even though usually it will get you nothing, because if you don't, I mean, how do you know if it yields you something before you consider it? Right, so you would have to consider it to find out 
um, if it if you got something or not. So make sure to always, always consider this. Don't assume, well, it's, it usually gets me nothing, so I'm not going to bother this time. Well, what about the, the one time out of 10 where you do get something that way? So you, you kind of have to check every time. Anyway, um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to test basically, well, let's put it this way. If I go back to this graph, if I find my two critical numbers, let's pretend that's negative 2 and 1, or those are these x coordinates. Let's pretend these are the x coordinates uh, at those two points, just to have an example. I can tell if the graph is increasing or decreasing here in the middle by picking one of the x coordinates somewhere in the middle and plugging into the derivative and looking for, well, is the derivative positive or negative? The, the two critical numbers that I found, these are the only places where the um, function can switch increasing versus decreasing. It, it can't switch anywhere else. So on this entire inter, um, in between part, it is only increasing or only decreasing. It cannot switch because I found the places where switching is possible. Okay, so um, I'm going to draw uh, basically a number line to help do this. This is not essential, um, but I think it does help um, to, to solve the problem. So I'll say this is step three, and I'm going to make a number line, and I'm going to mark um, my two numbers, so negative two and one, and I put little C's on them to remind me these are my critical numbers. Now, for each chunk of the domain, the graph is either increasing or decreasing. Okay, so I'm going to pick a test point or test value, I should say, in each chunk of the domain to plug into the derivative and see, well, is the derivative derivative positive or negative in each chunk? Uh, so in the middle part, I'll just pick zero. That that will be easy. And over here, I'll pick uh, say uh, ten. Um, anything greater than one will work. Ten, a hundred, two would work. Over here, I'll pick negative ten. Okay. So now I'm going to plug negative ten into the function, the, the derivative rather, and see what I get. Was this plus 6x? Yeah, plus, and I'm running out of room here, uh, but that's okay. Uh, 6 times negative 10 uh, minus 12. In fact, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's do this. Yeah, that'll work. That's fine. So then I get, um, what is that, 600 minus, six, minus 72. So yeah, this is positive. I don't care about the exact value. I just need to know, is this increasing or decreasing? And I draw an upward slanting line segment over negative 10, covering this interval as an indication to me that, yeah, the, the, the graph is increasing there. Okay. Some people put a big plus sign instead. Some people write the word increasing right I, I just i prefer to me it makes visual sense just to do a, a, sl a slash a slanted line like this so then i'll check uh zero so f prime of zero equals well six times zero squared plus six times zero minus 12 that's definitely negative zero plus zero minus 12 i can make a downward slipping line and then f prime of 10 so this is six times 10 squared plus 6 times 10 minus 12. So 600 plus 60 minus 12, that's definitely positive. This is part of the reason why I choose such a big number, because six, you know, 10 squared times 6, 600 is clearly going to overcome these values. And basically, the, the leading term determines the value pretty much. So I pick a big number to make that more, more obvious to me when I'm doing this calculation. So now I can conclude that the graph is increasing increasing on the interval uh, from negative infinity up to negative 2 and uh, 1 to infinity. So I'm using the union symbol to indicate that it's, it's both of these intervals that are part of the, the, the graph is increasing on both of these intervals. Um, the online homework might want you to put a comma, but um, the union symbol is the more technically correct thing to, to do. So then the function is decreasing decreasing on the interval uh, negative 2 to 1. And so I was able to get this information about the graph without the graph, just based on the derivative of the function. Okay, so basically this summarizes what we did with the previous example. Um, oftentimes I'll present a definition or a procedure and just you know go through the steps, you know say what it is, and then do an example. Um, in this section, I think it's going to be better to just show by example, just walk, walk you through, here's how you do this, and then afterwards summarize the steps. So basically, I guess I didn't call it step four, 
Um, but uh, in fact, let's go do that. So step four would be there, right? When you conclude, make your conclusion. So you're given some function. Step one is you find the derivative. Step two is you find the critical numbers, both looking for where the uh, f prime is undefined or zero. Uh, then you evaluate f prime at a test value from each interval. And then make your conclusion. The graph is increasing here versus decreasing there based on the sign of the derivative. And I'll point out also, um, in the previous example, I did not use brackets in my intervals because I'm not including the, the, the critical numbers. Uh, at x equals 1, the function is neither decreasing nor decreasing. It's, uh, it's going to have a low point there, in fact. Um, so it's, it's not doing either. So that's why I'm not including the endpoints. Anyway, um, Let's go on to the next thing. So this one is sort of an extension. We're going to use this increasing decreasing test as phase one of another kind of um, another kind of problem. So this problem says find the local extrema of f of x equals x cubed plus three x squared minus three and label as min or max. Basically, from that original graph, we're going to be looking for um, these high points and low points and saying, well, is this a high point or is it a low point? And notice that we have a low point here at the corner. Okay, so the high points and low points don't occur only when the derivative is zero. They could occur when the derivative is undefined. But also, we could have this situation where there's a place where the derivative is undefined, but we don't have um, a high point or a low point called local min, local max. Um, basically, we have to find the um, critical numbers, look for where the graph is increasing, decreasing, and then infer based on what the graph is doing. Like here, the graph goes from um, increasing to decreasing. And that means that um, at that point there, there's a high point. I can infer. Now, of course, we're looking at the picture, but I can infer if I go, oh, I know that the graph is increasing here and decreasing over here. It switches from going up to going down. It had to have a high point, right? If the graph switches from going down to going up, oh, well, it had to have a low point. We'll make that kind of inference. <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, I'm going to zoom into part of the function or part of the, the question won't be visible, but that, that's fine. We we um we need some room to work this out. So basically, um, I think in fact this is no, this is a different um example. This is not the same one, a different function. So step one, I'm gonna find the derivative f prime of x equals three x squared plus six x minus zero, which I don't need to write. Step two, where is this undefined? So I'll just write, I'll abbreviate this a little bit, f prime of x undefined question mark. Fine, question mark. Well, this is a quadratic function, much like the previous examples, and nowhere. We're not going to get a critical number that way. So now I can look for uh, solving, uh, set, set the derivative equal to 0 and solve. So 0 equals 3x squared plus 6x. Um, I can factor squared, 3x squared. I can factor out a 3x, so 3x times x plus 2, okay? And then I can separate the factors. So 0 equals 3x, or 0 equals x plus 2. Here I can divide by 3 on both sides. And here I can subtract 2 on both sides. So I get my two critical numbers, 0 and negative 2. So we might get a min or a max at 0. We might get a min or a max at negative 2. OK, so yeah, step 3. Do I have lots of room? Um. I have some room. We'll put it here. Step three, I'll make my number line. And again, the number line itself is not essential. It's the ch it's the testing of the um, individual. It's the checking of the uh, test numbers. So here are my critical numbers. So uh, we got three, three chunks of the domain. Um, so you pick something less than negative two, something between negative two and zero, and it's been greater than zero. Uh, I'll go with one for being greater than zero. I guess I'll do negative one for between, and I'll use, um, I'll say negative three. I, I think negative 10 and positive 10 are perfectly fine choices, but let's, let's go with these smaller numbers. So f prime of negative three. So this is going to be three times negative three squared plus six times negative three. So this is what, 27 minus 18. So that's nine. So that's Positive. Again, I don't care if this is 9 or 90 or 9,000. I just care about positive versus negative. So the graph increases there. And then f prime of uh, negative 1 equals um, 3 times negative 1 squared 
plus 6 turns negative 1, so I get 3 minus 6, that's negative. The graph decreases there. And then f prime of 1, that's going to be 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times 1. It's clearly positive. Every, everything there is positive. So the graph increases. So now step 4, I'm not just going to say, oh, the graph is increasing here, decreasing here. That's, that's part of the thought process, but that's not my result. I'm going to apply what's called the first derivative test, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, you know, the, the, the summary of it, but that's what we're doing here, essentially. Um, I'm going to say, well, you know, in this diagram, graph goes up, it does something, and then graph goes down, right? So there's a maximum there, right? And then the graph uh, goes down, and then it does something, and then it goes up. Well, there's a minimum there, okay? So I'm going to say that I have a local maximum at x equals negative 2. And I have a local minimum at x equals 0. Sometimes we also want the y coordinate. So if I needed the y coordinate, like, you know, what, well, what is the maximum? How, what's the value of the maximum? Then I could plug neg negative 2 into the original function and get a y coordinate and say, okay, this is the value of the maximum. If I wanted the value of the minimum, I could plug 0 into the function, the original function, not the derivative, into the original function and get, here's the y coordinate. This is the minimum value, the local minimum, right? Um, we don't need to do that in this case. Um, we often will not need to. Sometimes we will. Um, in 12.3, that's where we will pretty much always need to get the y coordinate as well. But for these examples, we don't need to do that. Okay, so let's go look at the first derivative test for local extreme. It's, it's kind of a big one. So there's a lot there. So uh, given a function f, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I should point out that the, the first three things are basically the same as the increase and decreasing test. So given some function f, in fact, let's do this. Yeah, given some function f, first find f prime of x, then find all the critical numbers, both through looking for where the derivative is undefined and through looking for where the derivative is equal to zero. Then pick a test value in each interval, basically the intervals that are between the uh, critical numbers, and evaluate f of x there. There, there is an exception here, which we'll get to. Basically, um, we get, there's an example farther down uh, the page where we'll get to this. Basically, there, if, if the original function, if if the derivative is not defined at some x coordinate and the original function is also not defined there, then that is not called a critical number. It's still a number we care about, and we'll have an example with that, but it's not called a critical number. You only have a critical number um, at, a, at a domain value of the original function. So if the original function is not defined there, it, it might be important, but it's not called a critical number. And that's important because in the online homework, you might be asked to find critical numbers. And if you list a number where the original function is undefined with the critical numbers, that would be counted wrong because it's not technically a critical number. So be aware that, that um, there are, at this stage, there are, there are numbers we will care about, but they won't be called critical numbers. So for each critical number C, we'll call the test value on the left A and the test, test value on the right B. If A, is, if A prime is positive and B prime is negative, that means the graph went from increasing to decreasing. It switched, and so there has to be a local maximum at that, at that uh, X value. If f prime of a is negative and f prime of b is positive, that means the function switched from decreasing to increasing, and it has a local maximum at that x coordinate. Otherwise, there's no local extremum at x equals c. Okay, so you might get no result potentially. Um, so just as a reminder, what does this look like? Well, in the first case, if you have a graph like this, okay, you have the local maximum, and that's because the graph is uh, has a positive derivative over here on the left, say say, x coordinate a is that point right there, right? X coordinate b is this point right here, and there the the derivative is negative. So you have a high point because the graph goes up and then down, right? The other, the second possibility is something like this, where you have um, a low point because the graph has a negative derivative on the left and a positive derivative on the right. The graph goes from decreasing to increasing. The third possibility. I probably should have drawn this ahead of time, but something like the following. That. 
where you have a spot where the graph flattens out a little bit and maybe the graph is increasing on the left side and it's increasing on the right side. So the slope is temporarily negative. Or not negative, sorry, uh, zero. The, the slope is zero at, at, at one point, but the slope is positive on the left and positive on the right. Then you get what's called a saddle point. Um, saddle point, why is it called that? Well, um, basically, if you do calculus with multiple uh, functions of multiple variables, so like instead of having a y equals f of x, if you have something like z equals f of x, y, two input variables, right? It, that's something you may have seen previously. You have two inputs for a formula, for a function. Um, the situation in which this happens kind of looks like a saddle. I'll, I'll try to draw it out, but, you know, I'm not exactly an artist, so I'll, 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 we'll see what I can come up with. So basically, you would have something like the following. Um, where in one direction, you've got low points. And then in the other direction, you have high points. So this right here might be called a saddle point because in one side, like if you're sitting on a saddle, right, um, your, your, your legs have to fit over the sides, but then the front and back kind of hold you up in the saddle, right? Um, obviously, this is not the best, but um, hopefully this kind of makes sense that this would be called a saddle point, at least somewhat. Hopefully, that's, that's kind of convincing. Uh, anyway, let's perhaps let's pretend that this never happened. <laughs> let's just move along from there. But this this is the reason for the term saddle point, because in the multivari multivariable version, you, you get something that kind of looks like a saddle if you have a competent artist at, at um, you know, doing it. Anyway, let's do this example. So, step one. Oh, and I, I left directions out, but basically we're going to find local min, local max. So, step one, find the derivative. So, f prime of x equals, well, zero minus two-thirds x to the negative one-third power, just using the power rule. Now, um, I could leave it like that, but I'm going to I'm gonna rewrite this. I'm going to notice, well, I have a negative exponent, so that means I can rewrite this as a two over three times x to the one third power. Or if I want, and again, this is optional, two over three, three times the cube root of x. If, if I want, I can do that, right? So uh, step two, I need to look for the critical numbers. So I'm gonna look for, well, where is this undefined? Where is f prime of x undefined? And if you look at um, really, really any of them, any any version of these three versions, maybe it's obvious, perhaps not. So pause the video and look at these. Are there any x values for which this function is undefined? Okay, so of course, if you look at um, this version here, if you plug in zero, the cube root of zero is zero times three is zero. So you would be dividing by zero. So you can't plug zero into the derivative. It's undefined. But the original function is, if you plug in 0, 0 to the 2 thirds power is 0, 5 minus 0 is 5. So uh, 0 is in the domain of the original function, but it's not in the domain of the derivative. So x equals 0. All right, we got a, we got a critical number um, from this step, which again, usually you won't, but sometimes you will, so you have to consider it every time. Then we're going to uh, look for where is the derivative equal to 0. And um, I guess I will... Again, go with this third version. Um, we have options here. You know how you do it depends. You know what, what order do you want to write things in? I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. What I meant to say was um, which version of this you want to use doesn't really matter. Um, but now, what I was I was kind of mixing two things together. So now the way I approach this, there's the order in which I do things doesn't really matter. There's more than one way to do this. Um, so you might be able to just look at this and tell what the answer is. When I look at this, I see. 0 equals a fraction, and the top does not have a variable in it, right? So really, there's no, there is no solution to this equation, because what can you plug in that would make the top 0? That you can't, right? The, the variable's in the denominator, and no matter, how, no matter how big of a number you pick for x, the result will not be equal to 0. It might be very close. If you make x 
100 billion trillion, well, then this would be pretty close to zero, but it's just not going to be zero, right? So you could say just from that, yeah, no solution, done. Another way you might want to do it is to sort of uh, think about cross multiplying. If we multiply both sides by three, uh, oops, wrong tool there, by three times the cube root of x on both sides. So you get zero equals two, which is false, so no solution. Um, but again, you, you just look at that and determine, yeah, there's no solution to that. So in this case, we did get a solution from this part. The part that usually gets you nothing, we got something. And the part that usually gets you something, we got nothing. So, you know, that, that's just going to happen sometimes. Anyway, step three, and do I have lots of vertical space? I have lots of vertical space and not so much horizontal. Okay, so I will do this. We'll see. Step three, make my number line. Okay, and I'll just mark zero. That, that's my critical number. And I need numbers on either side. Let's go with uh, let's go with negative one and one. Okay. So I want to evaluate the derivative at those two um, domain values. So f prime of negative one, this will be um, two over three times the cube root of negative one, which that's negative, right? The cube root of negative one is negative one. And then we have a fraction with the positive numerator and negative denominator, negative. So the graph decreases. And then f prime of one. And I should point out here that the the increasing, decreasing pattern will not always go up, down, up, down, up, down. It doesn't always alternate. So I should not as I should not go, oh, that's, that's positive. Done. I, I know for sure. I can't assume that. Probably that will usually happen that way, but not always. Everything here is positive, so I get positive. So yeah, in, indeed, this one does alternate, but but again, that's not always going to happen. So now I can apply the first derivative test and make my determination. If the graph goes down and then up, well, I know there was a low point. So I have a local minimum, local min at x equals 0. And again, if I wanted the y coordinate for some reason, I could plug zero into the original function and get five, as we talked about earlier. So, so the minimum value is five, but it's at x equals zero. Okay, so let's do this example. All right. So with this one, there's a couple of ways to get started. Um, before, of course, step one is find the derivative, but there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, basically, I'm going to write this one the following way. I'm going to write um, this is x squared over x plus 4 over x. Okay. Um, kind of like if you have, um, if you have uh, two fractions with a common denominator and you add them together, you just add the tops together, right? 2 plus 4 makes 6. If you have a fraction um, with multiple terms in the numerator, you can separate into multiple fractions. It's just reversing this process. Uh, you typically wouldn't do that with numbers, but you can. So this equals uh, x plus 4 times x to the negative 1 power. And the reason I did this is this will allow us to avoid using the quotient rule for the derivative step. Um, we don't have to do that. I just find it to be easier, just more convenient to do that. Step 1, find the derivative. Well, this will be a uh, 1 minus 4x to the negative 2 power, okay? Uh, step 2, where is this undefined? f prime of x undefined? Question mark. Okay. Well, if you, depending on how you think about it, if you um notice the negative exponent, that might tell you. Or you can also um, rewrite this as 1 minus 4 over x squared, that might become more obvious that, oh, x equals 0. You can't, you can't plug that in and get a result, right? However, 0 is not in the domain of the original function anyway. So x equals 0 is not a critical number, but it's a number that we care about. So I'm going to say x equals 0, um, but not a critical number. Not a crit number, okay? 
And later on, we, we will need to mark it on our number line. Um, but we, you can't have a local min or local max at a place where the function isn't defined at all. So we don't call this a critical number because there's no way to get a max or a min there. So now I need to look for where is the derivative equal to zero. Uh, I'll add four over x squared to both sides, I guess, is one way to do this. I can multiply x squared on both sides. Oh, and then I can just say, well, I can tell how to solve this. This is x equals plus minus 2, right? Square root of 4, but plus minus. Okay, so those are my critical numbers. So I got two critical numbers and then one important, though not critical number. So step three, my number line. Okay, so 0, I'll mark, and then 2 and negative 2. These two are critical numbers. Zero is not, I'm going to label it with u for undefined. The original function is undefined there, right? Um, you could label like n for not in the domain, right, if you wanted. But I would label it something. n for not in the domain works. And then now, since I have three um, numbers, whether critical or not, I have four intervals to check, right? So I need to pick one number from each one. So I, I think... The two middle chunks, it's pretty obvious what to pick, one and negative one. And I'll pick 10 and negative 10 for the other chunks. And I want to check the um, derivative at each one of these. So f prime of negative 10, this equals 1 minus 4 over negative 10 squared. Pretty sure that's right. Yep, okay. And uh, 1 minus 4 over 100, so 1 minus 1 over 25, that's definitely positive, right? One over a small number. So the graph is increasing there. And then f prime of negative one. So uh, one minus four over negative one squared. So one minus four is definitely negative. So the graph is decreasing there. Okay. And again, I, I should not assume that the graph increases. It might, but it might not. So f prime of positive one, this will be one minus four over 1 squared. Hey, that's also negative. So the graph is decreasing there. Okay. So it did not switch this time. Uh, and then f prime of 10. This will be 1 minus 4 over 10 squared. That is also positive. So the graph is increasing there. Okay. So now, do I have vertical room? I do. Now I can apply the first derivative test to make a determination. Uh, the graph, um, let me change the stylus here. The graph goes up and then down. So at negative two, there is a local max. And then the graph goes down and then up. So at two, there's a local min. And at zero, there's nothing because th that's an asymptote is really what that is. Okay, so we get a local max at x equals negative two. And we get a local min at x equals positive 2. Okay, so last example. Um, basically, the same thing. Um, step 1, find the derivative, f prime of x. This one's a little bit harder because I have to use the uh, product rule and the chain rule. So this will be uh, 3x prime times e to the 2x power plus... 3x times e to the 2x power prime. So this is 3 times e to the 2x plus 3x times 2e to the 2x. Cutting, cutting um, corners a little bit, but this is very similar to an example that we worked um, in the previous, previous video. Um, I noticed that both terms have e to the 2x as a factor, so I'll factor that out. That's not essential at this point, but it's something we're going to need to do anyway. And in fact, I can factor out uh, 3 e to the x. Uh, e to the 2x, rather. So 1 plus 2x is what's left over. Step 1 to so step 2. Where is this undefined? Well, if you think about it, 
for this linear factor, the domain is all real numbers. There's there's no, nowhere where this is undefined. Um, an exponential function, well, that exponent could be anything, right? So the domain here is all real numbers, so the answer is nowhere. Okay, so now I can look for where is the derivative zero? Okay, I can separate these uh, two factors. Uh, solving the equation on the right is pretty easy. Just subtract one on both sides and then divide by two. The one on the left um, might be very straightforward or perhaps not. Um, if you think about um, what exponential functions look like, how the graph looks, then you can have your answer pretty quickly if, if you know what that looks like. So um, let's do it over here. The standard graph y equals e to the x, just standard exponential base e function, looks something like the following. Something like that. The range is uh, 0 to infinity, not including 0. There's no way to get 0 as a result from e to the x. So this equation has no solution. There's no way to get uh, z the right-hand side to equal 0. By, you know, there's no number you can pick to plug in that, that turns e to the 2x into 0. So our only critical number is negative 1 half. So I can go to step 3 and make my number line, which, again, um, the number line itself is not essential. Uh, I just find it a, a convenient way to organize the information and make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, when you only have one critical number, that's not super important, I guess. Um, but when you have more, then this can make things easier. So I'll pick uh, 0 and negative 1. I think those will work fine. So f prime of negative 1. So this equals uh, 3e to the negative 2 power times 1 plus 2 times negative 1. Right? Which, if you think about it, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So this factor is negative. This factor is positive, so the whole thing is negative. Okay, so the graph decreases there, and we could we have a we um. I guess we can be pretty confident what's going to happen here, but we have to check. So three times e to the zero power times one plus two times zero. Uh, this is positive because you have a positive value. One plus zero is one times a positive value. So the graph increases there. So we have a local minimum. At x equals negative two, uh, negative one half. And there we go. That's um, I think that was three or four examples of um, doing the first derivative test. Uh, as you might predict, if there's a first derivative test, it would make sense that there is a second derivative test. And that's going to be well, that's going to be covered in the next section among a couple of other topics surrounding what's called the second derivative.